warm welcome to each of you um, at the Horaces Global Meeting. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends which part of the world you are. Uh, my name is Richard Ricky. I used to be the former CEO of KPMG in India and presently a board member of KPMG Dubai. Today we'll be discussing about the learnings from the past. It's difficult, but yet crucial. The world leaders have a lot of serious and challenging decisions to make at personal, societal, and global levels. But there's a greater need to make a more principled approach to making decisions, especially under this uncertainty. We have a very esteemed panel, and you will very shortly know as to why I said esteemed panel. And I'm going to go through a small introduction of each of them um, um, as I introduce each of them. We have uh, Nadine Bruder, who is, uh, is an award-winning strategist and German-born sustainability advocate. She founded and leads Just Damn Right. Nice organization, I would say. The wording is right. A hybrid platform which is backed by an international network of industry innovators and which creates and helps grow forward-thinking solutions that span sustainability-led investing, education, and culture. She's a member of the Federal German AI Association, advisor to startups and investors, and actively engages in the transition towards planet-positive societies. You'll find a common thread between all the speakers, actually, as um, I introduce them. Then we got Ramin Kress, who's the founding and managing partner of Human Capital uh, Network UK. Ramin is a sought-after pioneer of change, successfully leading large organizations through their cultural and digital transformation by inspiring and driving innovation since the late 90s. Marianne Morrow is the chief executive of Ninth Gear US. She brings with her more than 25 years as a corporate veteran in the financial, marketing, and advertising industries to her role as founder and CEO of Ninth Gear Technologies, where she is responsible for leading corporate strategy, scaling the company, and investor relations. Marianne was educated in Cornell University, Limon, Finance and Whittier Law School with continuous learning in Stanford University. Last but not the least, Geeta Sanka Panavar, who is the CEO and founder of Akira Capital Canada. Geeta is recognized as an international thought leader, an unrelenting advocate for women's equality and a committed philanthropist. She has been honored as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women for a number of years, actually. She's in that Hall of Fame. And she's Alberta's 50 most influential people and Calgary's top 40 under 40. So these are very accomplished people who are on the panel. And I will be talking very less so I can leave them to talk and you all can all listen to them. So I'll just say a few words before I get my panelists to come and, uh, uh, you know, give their views on different topics. We are going through one of the greatest panel. Uh, greatest uh, crisis in the world today, the pandemic, which happens, which has happened after almost 100 years. But however, when we look at history, a lot of these risks are exaggerated fears and misplaced priorities. And we can see the way the different countries have handled it. There are countless examples of societies worrying about some threat while ignoring the much larger ones, which are hidden, hidden when I say in plain sight. You can see it if you look for it. 50 years ago, people argued that poverty elimination was an idealistic fantasy and waste of money to try and even eliminate. However, extreme poverty has fallen from 52% of the 52% um, of the world in 1981 to 20% in 2020. This is an extraordinary achievement to have actually gone about doing it. Similarly, when the USSR and USA were on a uh, nuclear, um, you know, cold war. Everybody thought that the World War Three is going to break out. But today, what is what are people talking about is access to knowledge via the internet, regardless of your income, nationality, or ideology. This is also a great change in the way humans think. Humans, by nature, are biased on previous experiences, and this experience is also based on data. And leaders are so stuck with their previous experiences that they are not willing to accept the new facts um, uh, and are biased in from their previous experiences and will, uh, though the facts are put before them and they are not guided by the current level of experiences. On the world side, on the one hand, we have the world is getting richer, healthier, edu more educated, more peaceful and better connected with people living longer. Yet half of the world is potentially unstable. 
protesters around the world are showing a growing unwillingness to tolerate unethical decision making by the past to be an increasingly educated and internet connected generation is rising up against the abuse of power food prices are rising water tables are falling corruption and organized crimes are increasing debt and economic insecurity are increasing climate change continues to be a major issue and the gap between the rich and poor is not coming down in fact it's widening dangerously especially during the pandemic uh, <clears throat> the world leaders have a lot of serious challenges in front of them and one of them is how are they dealing with the risks so first is <clears throat> do they even understand what is the nature of the predictions that are going to which are coming across and when they look at risk they need to look not only the likelihood of risk taking but also the impact that the risk will have on their decision making and they need to prioritize which decisions to make and what actions to take especially in an uncertain world human beings are prone to work by looking at patterns and filtering filtering them through what we already know and we believe that ai which is there will do exactly what we have been used to doing and this uh, is something which we will be discussing as we go along in the panel uh, the world is on the cusp of revolutionizing many sectors through artificial intelligence but the way the ai systems are developed need to be better understood due to the major implications these technologies will have on society as a whole today more than ever before the ethical issues being discussed again and again as to how people are being trained the technologists to actually use this uh, do they understand the uh, the human side of it uh, before they take some of those decisions and artificial intelligence is already altering the world it is making things much more efficient it is improving the efficiency but however lot of uh, calls are being made especially on big tech and others about policy regulatory and ethical issues this keep coming up from time to time and so i would say artificial intelligence is an inflection is at an inflection point its development and application can lead to unprecedented benefits for global change uh, for the global challenges such as climate change food security healthcare and education but its application has to be managed in such a way that the digital economy that we are building out is much more it's not discriminatory discriminatory so uh, so ai artificial intelligence as such has a long way to go before it starts playing a significant role in decision making analytics is already playing a significant role but ai is catching up and it's time when we look at it i will now come to my panelist uh, and uh, get their views on different topics and i want to start with marianne uh marian you are the technologist in our group you are the one who actually has set up this company and uh, you have a great this thing so the first question to you do you think that past behavior is indicative of future results as a technologist and player in the financial services space how did this industry fare in the face of covid-19 pandemic what opportunities or adaptions have you seen as a result Thanks for that. I'm so pleased to be here and present to you from Silicon Valley. And just to set the table, um we at Ninth Gear are a new startup and you probably never have heard of us, but we use both distributed ledger technologies as well as AI in our tech stack. And what we do is move currencies around the world, euros to dollars to yen, and instead of it taking 48 hours, we do it in seconds. So for those capital markets folks that are in the room ninth gear optimizes liquidity management powering fx trades with intraday lending and my background um as you mentioned is over 25 years in institutional finance and capital markets and through that lens i look at technology and finance and see that the financial industry as a whole really treaded water in 2020 uh it's so clear to me that past behavior is not indicative of future results and the world fundamentally changed in 2020 we're not going back but so many i see cling to the old ways of doing things um and have done that for years so 2020 um it was not as a shock to me that that many were not prepared for that uh, most of us live in a world that's um digital first we all have these phones that are in no more than 2 feet from our bodies um but the back office of finance in particular is not that way it's analog not digital so 
I believe that COVID-19 is not only a catalyst for change, it's an accelerant. And business as usual is no more. New technology has to be at the forefront. And if you've asked banks as we rolled into 2020, if their teams would be working from home um, for a prolonged period of time, they would have said no. Uh, one of my clients was the only person um, who was a trader of FX, was the only person working in a 60-story office building for a few weeks because his bank was not ready for this global pandemic. And who among us could have predicted a year like the one we just experienced? So I see a clear unfolding of opportunities across the global markets. I don't believe that the full extent of the pandemic has been priced into the credit markets. I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with distressed securities, and there's so many opportunities. I see that firms must really innovate and embrace this shift to modernize end-to-end processes. You know, the world has changed, as I mentioned, we're not going back. And there's this clear need for this modernization of markets. Um, we see so many um, things that don't hit the papers, um, it, at least in, inside of our company. Um, we see so many things with our peer groups of, of um, delays, failed trades, risk, and expense for market participants. And it's really because of these antiquated systems where technology has been used for processing, but not in the design of the market. And we're seeing so many new technologies that are coming forward. At the same time, it's, it is possible to improve the transparency of these markets and also improve investor confidence and demonstrate fair treatment for all participants. So, you know, that's what we concentrate on at Ninth Gear is to develop these technologies for modernization. And the recent trouble that we've seen with trade halts would not be repeated in a world that is ready for that. So I believe that now is a great time to invest in a substantial campaign to implement these modern technologies to improve performance. And while it's quite nascent, it's apparent that when harnessed correctly, Distributed ledger technology will eliminate some of that dodgy plumbing that still powers a lot of the back offices and move us from analog into digital. So I think that the opportunities are endless and it, it's kind of like 2007 all over again and, and new businesses, I believe, will spring up in ways that we couldn't have imagined, you know, not, forget 20 years ago, not even five years ago. So I think that the possibilities for these new technologies are going to be endless. But to answer your question one more time, past behavior is not going to be indicative of future results. And we're not going to be able to do the same things we used to do in order to be prepared for 2022, 23 and beyond. Marianne, that's a very positive note for the listeners that there are good opportunities waiting for all of us uh, as the post-COVID period we get into. So thank you very much for that uh, answer. Remin, you're the man who is there at the center of all change, transformation, worked in major consulting firms before you have started this new life of yours. How did, what do you see in all this work in corporate plus your current work? How does culture play an important role in this new economy? Uh, which we are seeing now. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, look, I I think the, the, the there's two different dimensions that uh, that we're seeing, and I think uh, there's a tremendous amount of talk about change, um, and I sometimes, unfortunately, have the feeling that it's talk for change for the sake of talking about change, but actually not necessarily. Uh, having a clear path or direction as to what you actually want to do. That said, um, you know, only two to three years ago, at least uh, continental Europe, by and large, whenever you started talking about culture, uh, people very quickly were uh, oblivious to call it smoke and mirrors. And I think it is only very recently um, that people appreciate that culture is way more than, you know, just an HR function or, or the like. That said, what is culture and, and how do you adopt culture? Um, we have to resemble trust, visibility, way beyond efficacy. And I think what you see a lot is, uh, it could give you so many different examples, but, you know, you have almost like the new kids on the block. Uh, you know, one era is all about digital transformation. 
And it's okay, so you know, that is what we're gonna do. But ask yourself, first of all, before you're spending gazillions amount of money and time, where do you actually want to end up? Another example would be diversity and inclusion. So new kid on the block, okay, we need to do a couple of things. But all of these aspects, including that of sustainability, uh, ESG, when are you really going to be able to have a strategy that you're willing to share? When are you able to broadcast and uh, share baseline information that are tangible, that you can see where you are, how to improve from uh, there onwards. And when you talk about culture, um, it is not, in my opinion, a nice to have. I think it is proven over and over again that having employees who trust, having employees who appreciate will deliver a great deal more to its organization uh, than, than uh, you, you could wish for. But that is a giving and taking. That is not something that happens by slipping on a pair of trainers and being all cool from one day to another. It doesn't work this way. And in particular, when you start looking at that, and uh, Marianne just mentioned that, if you see organizations in, again, continental Europe in particular, that are, you know, shy of getting their uh, fingers wet and tapping a toe in the water, it is not so much just a corporate decision to take of whether I want to be on the forefront of technology. I think it becomes a corporate social responsibility of every organization to enable its employees to be able to be exposed to new technology because unless they are, they're being shortchanged to the open market. So if you work in one company that has made decisions not to work with, what happens to the employees? if they choose to decide and want to go back to the open market when their peers and other organizations for two years had the benefit of playing with. So I think in my books, culture is at the forefront. I would also agree, and I'm glad Marianne mentioned this, to me, COVID has only highlighted an issue that has been underlying and lingering for a very long time. COVID is not uh, by any means subject to, oh, because of COVID we have. I would say what frightens me is the amount of people that as things slightly ease off, fall in the old trap of, oh, things are better now. Why don't we sit down and have a meeting? You go, why do you need that? We've just been very fine up to our trajectory to where we are doing it via video conference. And I think... You know, in everything there is, you know, you have to take a balance. But I'm afraid that people are somewhat waiting post-COVID to what, in a way, is sort of a reset. And I think it's not a reset. I think it's a, it's a reinvention of the future. And it's a remarkable opportunity. But people need to have the willingness and uh, the strength to walk the walk. Sure. Thanks, Remy. I think you very nicely put it. I think you have brought tomorrow into it. COVID has just brought tomorrow to today. Uh, and uh, we have made us see it in that way. So, Geeta, coming to you, you are the one who actually deals with capital flows and, you know, investments, etc. So, uh, where are you seeing these capital flows taking place uh, in this new, evolved, or more literate societies we live in? And while you are there making those investments or part of the group, how much does culture actually play a role while you decide on your investments in companies? I think that's a great question. Um, I think uh, uh, I'll start with a little bit about my background because I, yes. as an investor, I, I believe you should always understand the lens within which people view the world in order to understand the biases that we all bring to it um, from the experiences that we have had. So for me, I'm an investor, I'm a business builder, um, I'm a community servant, and I'm also a philanthropist. And I ran an energy investment um, business here in Calgary, Canada, that has raised and deployed over a billion dollars in, in, in assets. Um, and I've taken two companies public. The last one just last month, Green Impact Partners, which is about building a more sustainable world through clean energy. And um, I just recently launched the ESG Bank, which is about building a more sustainable and radically inclusive world uh, by helping to address financial um, system inequalities that are creating um, systemic uh, 
issues um, in our society today. Um, I'm also a woman in leadership in industries that tend to be dominated by men, both financial services and energy. And I care deeply about making a positive impact in the world, in my business, in my committee, um, and with the people around me. And because of my personal history, I do have a bias towards reimagination, reinvention, and reinvigoration. So when you think about capital flows, I think um, to to what uh, you heard from some of the panelists earlier, uh, COVID has changed. It has changed the world. It has pulled back the curtain on um, the deep inequalities that do exist in society. And we have to acknowledge that the world that we are living in is just no longer the same. We used to live in a probabilistic world where we as leaders could identify um, the fan of possible outcomes uh, and then leverage our, our decision-making capabilities, our team's judgment, our experience and probability weight the outcomes and therefore make investments along, along that fan. I think, however, as we think about the world changing, this puts us into a category of um, uncertainty that we've not seen before. And what we are seeing is that income inequality, partly as a cause of and partly as a consequence of um, uh, the pandemic, has distributional implications for shutting down national economies for months, right? And there are those of us who can stay healthy, who can quarantine, who have groceries delivered, um, in the service of public health and our own. And we can continue to earn income while we do that. And the percentage for most of those people in, in economy is about 20 to 30 percent. But for the majority of people in labor markets, they cannot do that. And the tension between those of us who can and who cannot is manifesting in many different ways. Because although they cannot protect their health as they cannot sacrifice their income generation, well, what income inequality is also revealed to be part of is not just a matter of personal health, which has always been true, but is now also a matter of public health for everybody. And it has been time, and we've seen an acceleration as a result, to that considers the precariousness of lives of the people who on, with, on whom we have relied on for for, um, for 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 throughout our history. And what that has been doing is that has been changing capital flows because what started as this push to build a more sustainable world through clean energy pre-pandemic has now evolved into a broad movement for change where people are recognizing that if we can change money flows, it is one of the keys to a better world, to improving equity, diversity, inclusion, reducing carbon emissions, and scaling sustainable industry. And increasingly, what we're seeing is that just like consumers have with the brands that they have chosen, investors and boardrooms are realizing that they also have to make choices in whether their money funds, values aligned, services, products, initiatives, and industries or not. And so this is a this is a really interesting trend. And it started on the consumer side and it's been growing over the last five years with the zillennial um, uh, age range where they have been raising their voices, their votes and their wallets to align with um, with the, with their values. And this is a on the consumer side, all consumer brands recognize that this is a generational culture shift that is reshaping lives, attitudes and behaviors of consumers and therefore driving commercial change. But what people did not recognize is that those same people who are buying brands and making choices are also the ones that sit as stakeholders behind global sovereign institutional and private capital. And they are now driving capital allocation decisions. As we recently saw with the major um, oil and gas companies in the world bringing on, um, being forced to bring on activist investors and consider um, and consider climate change as one of their key risks. As we've seen last year, even in the year of COVID, of um, more than almost 50% of proxy votes for public companies um, by the top 10 fund families were in favor of ESG resolutions, therefore causing major institutions and businesses to actually start declaring themselves net zero by a certain date or focused on um, racial equality or focused on uh, uh, 
eradicating systemic inequality. And so I think as it, there's no longer anymore an ability to think about business without purpose and because you cannot have profit without purpose anymore because you will lose the congruency that is required between your external world and the validation with your consumers as well as your internal world, which is the validation and the values of your own employees. And this is driving that shift in capital flows, that drive towards impact investment, that desire to build a more sustainable and radically inclusive world for all. And we are seeing it starting at organizations that have large stakeholder bases that are that come from this generation and it is now flowing from the margin to the to the to the mainstream. And so I think if you are a company that cares about access to capital, if you are not paying attention to this, you will see the capital flows just just pass you by. So it's a, it's a very important topic. Thank you Geeta. I think good value purpose impact funding this is the way you want money. Uh, I think Geeta just spelled out uh, the mantra for it. Uh, Nadine coming to you now uh, you have done a lot of work around on the government side institutions etc or you do a lot of work around there. People on the ground want change, want to engage, want to see change. How do governments and institutions of the day accept change and work with communities collaboratively? Um well so up until here like I can agree to everything that uh, the previous uh, speakers have uh, said and uh, brought to your attention and the table it's amazing and um through my work at the intersection of um investment sustainable innovation culture and education I've been experiencing for years now I can say a decline of trust in governments and institutions even on the very ground level of people like you and you and I, so to speak. And studies even um, show, for example, that people feel that their votes don't count anymore in democracies and that it's too much of power plays among parties instead of collectively pursuing solidarity. We have witnessed this um, last year during the pandemic. The beginning was everyone was, okay, <laughs> let's stick together. We, uh, let's go through this together. Um, but now everything is or seems to kind of again, fall um, into pieces. People also think uh, there is no, and not enough financial and system support for innovations and improvements on communal levels. People even think that politicians are corrupt, to be honest. And I found, um, yeah, the, unfortunately, the pandemic accelerated the erosion of trust around the world. And Edelman, um, the agency, recently published its trust barometer for this year, and the numbers and figures showed it. And they even call this development an epidemic of media misinformation and widespread mistrust of institutions and leaders across the world. And so there is this huge disconnect um, between, let's call it, the governing groups and the people on the ground who want to see change. And as we are facing the urgent need to transform our economies, but also our societies, not only digitally, but also sustainably at the same time, which is like another hurdle, right? This is a serious th a threat and an alert, I think, because how can you make the shifts if the majority of society doesn't trust you? And regarding your question, when I look, for example, at EU funding programs, um, I see a lot of acceptance, I would say, for change and more engagement with communities on, on the ground um, based on the way how programs are designed, respectively, in what kind of themes and topics um, funding is poured. Um, let it be for public education on democracy, campaigning on sustainable ways of living, for technology innovations and artificial intelligence. However, on a micro level in countries, it's similar to what um, Ramin explained um, from a corporate perspective. The extent and quality of collaboration with different industry communities or regional communities differ quite a lot. Existing networks, systems in place and institutions still work isolated and very often I mean, like most of the cases, they don't have the needed uh, digital infrastructure to engage very um, easily and um, come to the standard what every everyday people have already on their smartphone or with their smartphone. 
talent coming from outside and synchronized actions among and across institutions are lacking. And I also want to give you another example because I find this so amazing and wonderful, um, which is um, from Taiwan. I'm a big fan of Audrey Tan and her work as the digital minister of Taiwan. And it's absolutely fascinating. I think specifically for us European cultures that somebody like she with her background in um, IT and the IT world, she's now the, she has this important role and can do actually so much in the country. Again, like coming from the IT world, she implemented the mindset, iterative processes and open source systems approaches that we know from the IT world into her work. And that way the government is able to engage with a large number of inhabitants down to a communal level and to also collectively work on societal improvements and implementations of innovations across the country. So there is this direct feedback loop and direct um, systems of engagement within this country, which is absolutely fascinating. And regarding the media, um, I think they have as much responsibility as governments to use technology responsibly and design supportive and inclusive um, inclusive systems and societies and not harmful ones that we are still experiencing now. So I see, I see, and I think we see a lot of changes in the upcoming years when it comes to media and how the, um, the collaboration between eventually also governments and institutions and the media is shaping differently. Richard, you are muted. Uh, we call it the fourth pillar of our democracy. So media is an important role to play and uh, trust all time low media, not their corruption in, in the systems. Thank you for raising all these points are very important points relevant. Geeta coming to you now, you raise this point about value driven young generation. The new generation is very value driven. Um, uh, they uh, look for companies they want to work or they are looking for that. How critical is this role of values and purpose? You did mention about it. I mean, you did speak about it quite a lot, actually, in the growth of any organization. So one is the investments that they will get in and how important it is for their own growth. Is there any, would you like to throw some light on this, please? Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's critical. Uh, I think it's deeply, deeply critical. I think the more distributed we get, the more connected we need to feel. If you look at um, the the issue with uh, individuals between 16 and 30 today, um, that connectivity, mental health is one of the biggest issues because they have not had the opportunity to live their lives with a connection to others. And so where that has now been fueled and has grown is a greater drive towards finding and aligning themselves with values that they care about. It doesn't have to be the same as what you care about, but it's it's the it's their own communities um, around uh, the world and around the country and around the values that they care about, whether it is climate change, whether it is systemic inequality, whether it's radical social impact, whether it's organic living. This is now literally the next gen consumer individual investor. And, and why is this so important is because in the US alone, 40% of trade volume is retail trade volume, rough carpentry. And so when you actually look at that, you can't no longer as a B2B company ignore um, what what consumers care about and what this zillennial generation cares about. And so for them, they are choosing purpose, impact and connectivity in their daily decision making. It is that rise of shared values and social issues and sustainability. But and what that's driving because they care about it is it's driving this conversation at the boardroom table. Every single boardroom table has had a conversation about hashtag me too, Black Lives Matter, climate movement, EDI. If they haven't, they better because they will be removed if they are not. And so this is deeply, deeply important. And when you actually look at the statistics, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're amazing. Like it, it's definitely worth it. And I see them, they're coming out every, uh, every 
every uh, six months or every year as people look at what um, what they care about. But over right now, over 88% of Gen Z feels that their generation has the power to transform the world for better. 76% of this generation believes that ethical drivers are three times more important to build company trust than competence. And this goes to the point that uh, the panelists were making earlier. If, if trust is eroding and now it's going, it's getting rebuilt by basically looking for values drivers, this is something we need to pay attention to. And why is this group important? Besides our own innate desire to help and be better individuals, they also should be listened to because $24 trillion of wealth is being transferred to millennials over this next decade. And so if we are not paying attention as a society, as business, as capital, to what they care about. And what they care about is deep purpose, impact, and connectivity. Then, um, then uh, we will fail in all aspects of our own businesses, governments, and, and media, because they will look elsewhere for it. Thank you, Geeta. <clears throat> so Nadine, coming to you now, you spoke about government. How do you think we can make the government and institutions become less of an overhead and more supportive and accountable to what is happening on the ground? I know it's a short time, but whatever a few points you can give. It is it's a long, long discussion. <laughs> my list of recommendations would be yes. super long, but I'm just kind yeah. of running out uh, a few. Um, I think for governments to pursue prosperity, that's like their goal, right? Uh, democracy and uh, sustainable practices, it's absolutely critical to nourish self-empowerment of people and local communities, similar to what um, Gita just kind of described, because we see a lot of uh, fragmentations and new values, specifically in the new generations, younger generations uh, rising. And I think, therefore, direct budgets, for instance, on local and regional levels for flexible case-based spending would be very helpful. And then also transparent reporting by communities is required, right? Like it's um, a give and take. But then communities are much more empowered to similar, like corporations have flexible budgets for innovations, um, which is not on the plan, uh, yearly plan. So you can basically help yourself and the community knows best in what kind of ways to invest to nourish the, the community and uh, the region itself. Um, similar with distributing institutional fundings, I think less bureaucracy, more entrepreneurial thinking, even during the design of programs, more access for individuals. If public competitions, then please communications about them across as many communities as possible. <laughs> Also, more direct involvement of people on the ground, respectively of practitioners and different experts in higher level decision making processes as needed. Efficient real life feedback and interactive execu um, executation loops um, have been have, have to be in place, I think, and they need they need to be facilitated through digital infrastructures. Definitely, there is no way around to do this. Overall. We cannot afford any longer to spend too much time and money to create, for instance, one study after uh, another or having countless meetings and get stuck along the way to execution. So direct, much more entrepreneurial and with um, systemic feedback loops that are very effi um, efficient and transparent. And lastly, more public-private partnerships for, let's say, infrastructure-related investments are needed, which are managed transparently eventually also tracked by new digital technologies, more investments in quality education, starting at the level of kindergarten. It's critical. Um, that's the IP of any country. And as well as more and true support for entrepreneurship is needed. And to your question, how can they become more accountable? Well, I think on a systems level, transparent processes and digital, digitally enhanced trackings of outcomes and performance uh, would be a start. Some institutions, um, the other panelists mentioned it already in the realm of um, corporations, even some institutions, they um, incorporated, they started to incorporate the SDGs or the ESGs as some way of reporting for responsibility and accountability, yet they can be done so much more as Ramin, for instance, put it. And on an individual level, I think it all comes down to education and values, because I think I truly believe that being in service of others 
demands to be aware of one's responsibility towards planet, the people, and a sustainable future. And that's all I can say here. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, entrepreneurship. Ramin, uh, continental Europe, you said, is not willing to adapt to changes quickly. Uh, is you think there's a lack of investment in entrepreneurship at the moment? Okay, that's an easy one. Yes. Um, but then let me jump straight into following through with what Gita and Nadine just said. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really concerned. Uh, and I'm ultimately, I mean, Human Capital Network is its, its mission, its passion is really to creating a more desirable future for the generations to come. It is that generation I'm concerned about. And I think Gita, you just said 16 year olds, you know, my boys are 12. When I look at what they're confronted with, and they're, you know, they're very privileged to go to an incredible school, but what goes on in everyday life of what they have to face, uh, largely driven by, uh, by changes, by access to uh, what's going on in the current environment, whether that is gaming or the likes of that, of which we know creates huge issues of mental illness we haven't even dealt with uh you know accepting neurodiversity we're talking about diversity and it's a very niche area i'm very involved in diversity but i view it as being incredibly broad it's beyond color gender uh, religion it's everything and so you know when i imagine a world that you know ideally i would like for my kids or even their kids because there's an enormous amount of stuff that needs to be done. Education is key. So here's one of the points. If you want to drive education, where do you start? Is it at education? Is it at the teachers? Or do we actually need to start at the corporates that give opportunities because that is, you know, the outcome oriented. If you want to be an engineer as a woman, well, there are jobs for you. Or so when I look at this, I look at equal opportunity. But now let's come to the point of investments. And let's look at that very, very quickly. Of course, there's a shortage of investment and it's a shortage of investment based on a presumption of a culture that doesn't fit Europe. We are not the Silicon Valley. We have our own values and attributes that can be incredibly harnessed. But all of a sudden, if everybody puts the KPI of being a unicorn, well, then you already have an issue because Europe, to some extent, no matter whether we like it or not, is fragmented. So if all it is that you are reaching out for and you have to become a unicorn, if corporate companies have yet not understood the value they represent beyond financials, route to market, access to market, understanding, research development, they could be driving innovation at tenfold versus that, it's a culture ratio, versus that of just the VCs. But then you ask your question, the question which I did the other day, and I, I couldn't stop writing about it, uh, which is who is the gatekeeper of innovation really? And the bigger question is who is the gatekeeper of innovation? If the corporates are too afraid for change, if the VCs want to measure themselves of how many unicorns they have exited, then ultimately the lack of customer and consumer choice becomes the bottleneck. And that I think is a huge thing that we need to solve because ultimately what otherwise happens is that most endeavors and most entrepreneurs will seek to move country. They will go to other places in order to get investment. And not only will we not own the future conglomerates that are coming out of new founders and businesses, which I, if you allow me for one second, just want to make clear, I think most founders do not set themselves out to disrupt. There is a huge opportunity to build the bridges and collaborate and give corporate companies the relevance to exist in the future. But if the doors are shut, if the culture prohibits, then what we're going to face is a very different Europe in the future which is something that we're already starting to create today. And that I'm afraid of for the younger generation. Okay, thanks, Ramin. Uh, Marianne, coming to the last question to you. When you look back at the previous year, how did it affect your business? You're a startup. Were you well prepared or were there areas that required development? This would be a good learning for others. 
Sure. We did quite well during the last year. We've always been a distributed team and that was critical because we were extremely well versed in the tools and protocols to run our business. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back out in person. Conferences are so integral. And when you spend three days with your tribe working on initiatives across the spectrum, you really have magic that happens. But as I want to bolt onto something that Nadine and Gita said, as the internet unleashed data and information, I see that technology, especially in distributed ledger, technology is a protocol for trust. So that is makes it a very exciting time um, in fintech and to watch the changes that are happening right here, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And I would like to thank all the panelists for all your valuable insight. And uh, our time is up. I'm sure.